turn do we see in restored and created systems? Now, let me start out. We had a wonderful meeting last night where we were talking about the different functions of the web. Basically, why do we care about these silly things? Now, why do we want to get our feet wet? Why do we get muddy? Why do we start mud all over our houses? Well, it's because of the function these serve in the system. What I like to do is I like to talk about these functions. What I like to do is try to talk to them, I talk about them as something that serves humanity. So, back in 1995, the National Academy of Sciences created a list of nine functions that they felt were extremely important to humanity. Now, I broke these into three distinct parts. The first part is the hydrologic part. And as you see here, the first ecological function is short term, water storage. We're going to come back and talk about that in a second. I'll just go on to the next. Long term, surface water storage, also a function. And third, maintenance of high water table. Now, I asked you as a group, you see me as a scientist, you see them as what? How do you take that and give it to a politician so that it makes sense? How can you express to them how important these things are? Think about that. We're going to come back to try to talk to it and figure it out. Uh, there's a second set in here, transformation cycle. And there are four parts to this. I'm not going to have enough time to just talk about this. It's a whole different lecture. Biogeochemical cycling. I will come back at the end and touch on it a little bit. But again, I really don't have time to go into that today. It's a very complicated process. The last two are two that I spend a lot of time with. And I'm going to use those to get to the first three. And that is maintenance of characteristic plant community. Again, I look at changes that take place in these systems due to stress. So these become, the last two become very important. And in fact, we use these to get to one through seven, the slowest maturation of ecological functions. Okay, take a look at this table real quick. This is your short term surface water storage. And again, this is kind of what I see when I look at it. Reduction of downstream peaks. Nice little a nice little uh, diagram showing, of course, what happens with wetland is you knock that peak down. We now know it's not just a function of delay of time, there's also evaporation, transpiration process that takes place, the delay of the water flow, etc. And what you're seeing is a decrease in that peak flow. Now, that's from a scientific point of view. What about the politicians? Are they going to look at that and going to see that, oh, this has value? Again, we'll come back to that in a second. Let's look at the other two. Again, this one is scientific point of view. Short term surface water, long term surface water, and make the high water. On a scientific point, again, this is what I'm going to see. What happens in those systems from an ecological perspective? Well, what if I did this? What if I turn around and start adding societal value? Now when I talk to a politician, I don't talk about short-term surface water storage. I talk about reduced property and crop damage. I talk about a lack of damage to life. I talk about its value to society. We can do that for the entire suite. We can talk about long-term storage as a maintenance of fish habitat, biodiversity. We can talk about <coughs> crops increased production. Those are things that we can talk to the politician about. But let me ask you something else. How do we, as scientists, measure those things? That's a whole different question. So the concept is we can talk about functions, but let's move on and talk to the politicians in terms of society and humanity. But one thing that came up yesterday we're going to talk to you about. We have a lot of coastal wetlands in this area. Where does the water for Taipei come from? Your drinking water doesn't come from the incoming flooding tides. It comes from the seeps, and this is a beautiful little um, pen that I saw up in the mountain. These are the recharge sources for your groundwater. 
So it's as important, again, when we speak to the politicians that they recognize it's not just local. It's going to be the adjacent properties as well, the watershed. We've got to get past the political boundaries. Okay. Now, I'm going to shift gears just a little bit. We're going to talk a little bit about habitat food. Again, if we look at it from bio value, basically here, I look at this part of it here. I look at changes. I see numbers. I see vegetation parameters. I see morphometrics. But if I'm going to translate that to a politician, I need to be talking about how it supports fisheries, aesthetics, how it does something for society, adds its economic value to that system. Now, how do we do that again? It's a complicated process. We are trying to do it through our assessment process. And I'm going to try to tie these together a little bit later in the talk. All right, so how did I get here? Well, like I said, I am a wetland ecologist. I'm a botanist, basically, by training. I look at vegetation dynamics, the change in the assembly of the good time, in response to stresses. Now, when I look at Whoops. When I look at creating and restoring wetlands, I'm looking at that same process. I'm looking at changes over time. The difference is, why do we restore and create wetlands? We're not just looking for changes. We are trying to restore the ecological functions that pay back to society. We are trying to create something for our society that is based in the ecological functions of these systems. So we have to go back and we have to measure, literally, physically measure parameters that we can use to explain maturation processes. In the United States, we call those ecological performance standards. And it's basically just looking at mathematical presentation of the biota in the system. And what I mean by that is very simple. You can go out, you can count my parents, how many do you have in that area, or you may want to count a number of different species of birds, or you may want to try to count or capture a uh, mud skipper. Actually, I spell that trying to get that one. But those little suckers run away from me. I can't catch them. I can't count them. So what do we do? Luckily for me, being a botanist, I've got the answer. Plants, they don't run away. They stay there. I can count them. I can pull a leaf off. I can taste them. I can do anything I want to them. They're not going to get me. So we look for these plants. In fact, in the United States and in most countries now, these EPSs are based on the morphometrics of plants. They're based on count. They're based on looking at what is there today and monitor it over time and what changes take place over time. These morphometrics, however, have had some problems. A few of the ones that we've used in the past, stem densities, the number of plants per unit area, the number of trees per hectare, for example, uh, it's also a measure of survival. We also have stem and bowl area. Foresters talk about diameter at breast height, four and a half feet, or 1.2 meters. And we have stem area at ground level. Now, I'm going to come back to that sag in a second. That turned out to be much more important than anybody thought. We also have things like canopy cover. Canopy cover is, is when you literally look at, go into a forest and look up and say, ah, that tree covers 50% of this area. Now, I might go out there and I might see a tree covering 50%. Dr. Ott might go out there and he may see that tree covering 30%. Of course, he's going to be wrong, but how do we tell the difference? And what we've got to do is come up with something that is more accurate so that Dr. Ott can go out, I can go out, we come up with the same answer. And that's where these morphometrics have failed. That's why we've had problems. Can we have measures like plant species richness? Ah, plant species diversity. Anybody know where diversity comes from? It, basically, it comes from disorganization. So you're measuring disorganization. Extremely difficult to do. And we don't know what it means. We don't know how to compare diversity indices. We don't know how to statistically treat it because there's so much variance in, in diversity measures. So, we've got some problems. We've got some problems that we know that some of these more familiar we've been using for about 20 years literally have problems. There's too much variability. We're not getting the accuracy. We're not getting the precision. So what are we going to do about it? What we did 
did is we actually received a long-term a long-term grant to test a bunch of these EPSs. How are we going to test them? Well, we set up seven hectare sized plots. This is a very large experiment. We planted seven different species of wetland trees. We treated them with different hydrologic processes. And then, four times a year, we went into this area and measured all of the morphometric parameters. Stem density, stem height, tree height, number of tree branches, etc., etc. Now, this is a massive data set. We did this over eight years. What it did give us was a massive data set that we were able to use to tease out the variables. So we collect the data from the control site, and then using carbon, which is one of the most important <coughs> ecological functions, carbon accumulation, we tested whether each of these morphometrics matched the carbon numbers that we had. We literally went out and took these trees. Some of these trees are 30 feet tall. Cut them down, dug up their roots. I have pictures of my students down six feet in the ground because they had it in all the roots. Also, they take the tree and cut it up and wait at the drying it in a large greenhouse. So this was a very, very extensive process that gave us some great data. Again, it took us eight years to get it all together. So we could compare that to, that gave us biomass, one of the most important aspects of function. And then our hypothesis was that by measuring the EPS, we were able to look at whether a restored or created system is replacing the loss of ecological functions. Make sense? So we went out, we measured the function, we went out and measured all the morphometrics, then tested the morphometrics against the known function. What we found, and I'll give you a little bit of orientation here, the p value is a probability. We use a probability of 0.05 which means 95% of the time, our data is not random. In this particular case, you see you have a p-value of 0 0.02, meaning there was a relationship between, and in this case, it's biomass of carbon. I'm using it as a uh, process of carbon here. And the percent of survival, how many trees survive year after year after year after year. And what you see here in the R square is whether this variable actually explains the variation of this variable. The magic number here is we look for a minimum of 0.6. So we've got a mathematical number that is compared to, and what we look for is a p-value less than 0 0.05, which we have. But this does not meet the criteria for cause in relation, cause and effect. What that tells us is that this particular EPS survival does not predict the ecological function. Now we went through all of them. I just picked a few out here. Here is uh, percent cover. This is this is number. Our percent cover, and you can see what happens as the older it gets scattered. Okay, and again we need it. There is a relationship, which is interesting. We're going to come back to that in a second. But at the same time, it doesn't meet that 0.6. So it's not a cause and effect relationship. So something's driving them together. They're growing together. But cover is not going to explain your ecological function. Last, or as Kim would say, lastly, the, we look at canopy cover. And as you see, the smaller trees, these are the earlier growing trees, are not pretty tight. Here I've got a, uh, again, a p value is significant, but I still don't make that 0.5, uh, 0.6. It's close. It's close. But look what happens. As the trees get bigger, they get farther and farther apart. And as we went, we went back to the ninth year and actually measured them, that kind of fell apart. That's actually not part of the study, so I didn't put it in here. Okay? So that doesn't work either. Again, we're seeing the relationship, but we're not seeing the cause and effect. Okay. So what does that mean? Well, the one that did fit into this was this SAG, S-A-G, Stem Area Ground Line. Here, 
when I put it in, and this is just one tree I'm showing, we had an R squared of over 99.99. Here, we were getting the cause and effect at a p-value of 0 0.001. So it's statistically significant. This one particular uh, parameter, this one particular multimetric, literally was giving us the answer of what the ecology, the ecological function was doing in that particular system. We also looked at all these relationships. Remember I said, my God, they're, they're tracking each other, but one's not causing the other. And we found that there's a positive relationship between the height, and crown diameter. We also found that by measuring the stem area, and here's a little, a little example, the stem area ground line is actually taken right at the ground line there. It also measures survival and density just simply by doing it. So you're getting that number as well. And it can include, it can include trees of any size. In our particular area, this becomes interesting because we plant a lot of young trees that are very small. You can't do a DBH on a one meter tall tree, but you can do the ground area. We've also found that when a tree gets up to four and a half feet, or 1.2 meters, DBH, that the DBH matches the stem area at ground level. So we can convert from one to the other. Okay, so this seems to be a very nice way to measure. Comparable with math as that I said, we can, we can convert this to DBH very easily. It's easy to measure. If you've ever tried to measure density, if you've ever tried to measure cover, they're a very tedious process. If you ever try to do biomass, it's a very, very tedious, very, very difficult process. So this is easy to do. It can be done on all species. You've been able to find all species work. So, we can use this as a measure of ecological functions. We now have a way to tie our growth, our changes in that system to ecological functions. Now, what does that mean? Well, there are static vegetation processes that we can use that will give us an ecological function. Is that system maturing? I can pick out the ecological function and hopefully find the parameter. And we have done this for several other parameters as well, including habitat. All right. So we can go to these create and store systems, look at ground area diameter change over time, and calculate the growth and the maturation process in that restored or created system. The nice part about it is this takes a lot of that variation out of the equations. We can statistically test these as well. Very nice from a scientific point of view. But you say, what does that mean in Taiwan? Why do we care? Well, we can take these and transplant them into the systems over here. We can use them, perhaps not exactly the same way. But a little bit of history is Many of you were here in 2014 when we came over and we sat down. It was Kim, myself, John, from Science with the Scientists. We were asked to help put together some guidelines for restoration. We came up with a process. Uh, I'll talk about multi-use and wise use here in a second, but a process that takes those into consideration. And in 2014, we presented our <coughs> recommendations to a series of NGOs, government agencies, etc and got feedback from them, and in the end, put together the recommendations as edited by many, many, many different people. So it gave us a good, well-rounded process that literally talked about wise use, and when I say wise use, I'm talking about ecological functions and human use. The big difference is, when I talk about it, particularly to a politician, I'm talking about you can use a wetland system as long as you don't disturb the natural functions within that system. Once you do, you disturb the natural functions, you literally change all aspects of maturation in that system. So why is use is, yes, we can use it, we can, we can go in there and fish, we may even cut a, a few mangroves out, we can dig a hole someplace and plant grasses, whatever. 
but you're not necessarily going to change or alter ecological functions. Okay, so there are many things you can do. What they all are, we don't know, of course. Multi species management. I, when we first came here back in 2014, uh, Ken, I believe he's here somewhere, Ken took us out to what he, he had said, unfortunately, was a failed mitigation process, a mitigation site. And I walked out into this beautiful mangrove, mud flat, open water forest. And I said, why do you consider it a failure? Well, it was built to attract a single species. I think it was a black lady stilt. Is that right? Something, something like that. Yeah, a, a bird. <laughs> but it was built with one species in mind. Now, the problem was there were 50 species of birds in there. There were all kinds of fish. They had this beautiful mangrove forest, so a tremendous amount of biotic diversity in the system. Had that been designed just as a multi species approach, and yes, you can put in there, we're trying to attract the black stilted tweed bird or the black faced um, spoonbill. Put your hat on. The black faced spoonbill. But the bottom line is look at it from an overall picture. And that made more sense. That, that's A1, I believe is what they call it, is a beautiful example of what can be done to restore a wetland system. But the politician said saw it as a failure. With this concept in mind, it then becomes a beautiful success story. All right, so we also, and this is a big one, talk about in that recommendation, watershed. Again, where does the water come from in Taipei? It comes from the mountains. It's recharged through those systems. We can't separate out those recharge systems and do just wetland protection in the city of Taipei. We've got to reach across those political boundaries and get the other counties, the other uh, cities or countries, what are the counties here? Uh, whatever, get them involved. We've got to avoid the politics, show them what they can gain from it, give them something that they can economically see. Okay, so we've, got to, we've got to move away from the political boundaries. Wetlands do not recognize boundaries. Okay. So, where is this going? Well, now, working with Dr. Shao and Wong and Pin, Dr. Pinman Kuo and several others, we're putting together a process where we are literally looking at evaluation or an assessment program that allows us to do two things. First, it allows us to go look at a site and judge whether or not we will be able to restore that site in a valuable way. Way, one that will achieve the ecological function. Now, there's the question again how are we going to measure that? Well, we'll try a few things. That's why I'm here. I'm going to be here another six weeks after this, and we'll be out in the field putting the students out in the mud. I'll stand up and watch. But the bottom line is we're going to try putting a lot of this together into a process to identify which EPSs work in Taiwan using some of the ones we've used and we know work in the United States. Also, to develop an assessment protocol that, again, lets us see what is happening the first time. Can it be done? And then you can monitor this year after year after year, and you will be able to get a good feel for the maturation of the ecological functions. Is it achieving those ecological functions? So you will be able to set up, hopefully, program to show what is going on. Was it successful? Was it not? Okay? Now, we, we identified four main functional, or four, three functional areas. Uh, hydrology, water quality, habitat diversity. There's a water quality again. We're going to come back to that. Uh, and we also added wise use potential. All of these are not the easiest thing in the world to categorize. And what we are doing is working on processes to categorize them. We first came up with a suite of high, medium, and low. Whether we stay with that is, is uh, going to be seen this month. For example, hydrologic conditions are high. And this comes from uh, Dr. Post's work. If you have water impoundments, water control structures, 
that allow you to control the water at specific levels. Now, how is this going to fit into inland wetlands? Don't know yet. We've got to work it in. You'll see the sheet here in a minute, and we have a different section for the inland wetlands. We're going to work some of this out. All right? Medium if you get this particular percent. And then low if you get less than that. No, no water quality structure. Basically, these are things that people will be able to go out on site and determine if they're present. Now, water quality is going to be tied to high, medium, and low, again, but it's going to be tied to the state standards. Taiwan has established minimum quality standards. So those can be easily tested in the field and put into this equation. And then habitat diversity becomes even a little more, this becomes a little more complicated for us. By uh, greater than seven habitats. What are seven habitats? Well, I'll show you what seven habitats are. But something else pops in here. Scale. What if I've got seven different habitats, but one of them, let's say it's a hectare size site. One of them is only 10 meters by 10 meters, and one of them is 90. Well, we run into this evenness problem that we're going to have to work with. We're going to have to figure it out. This is just a stop. All right, and we have medium and low. And, and what we're looking at here is not just the number of habitats we're looking at invasive species. There are numbers in the literature back in the United States on percentage of invasive species that alter the habitat where they become ecological engineers. We can use those numbers for now, but we really need to probably refine them for Taiwan's environment. Just a quick shot looking at, this is a data sheet we put together for trial. You'll notice that a lot of it is just general information, so you know who's been there, when they were there, etc. Uh, we have our, our rankings listed down here. This is where we, we've broken out tidal and inland systems. Uh, we, again, need some refinement. Uh, work in progress. And here you can see, again, here are your habitats, your seven different habitats. Uh, again, that's something we've got to, we've got to work out the scales on these. There's something else we're going to do in here. Think about a mangrove. All right, if you walk onto a site and you see a mangrove swamp system in there, how do you know it's healthy? Is it three mangroves per square meter? Is it ten mangroves per hectare? We don't know yet. That's something we're going to have to figure out in the field. It's going to take some time. We're going to have to do that in the next week. We get some numbers and put it together. Once we get those numbers, we can move on to the next step. The first being to field test the data sheet. Now, that data sheet is going to rely upon a training manual. That training manual is going to have all the specifics of what you do when you go to the field. How do you fill out that sheet? It's going to have the information on what is a good, healthy mangrove system. The technician is going to have to take the time and make that determination, but they're going to have guidance in this name. And then we're actually working on that now. We have list of invasive species. We have list of endangered species. What percentage of invasives? Hopefully we'll have that worked out. That goes into this manual. That will drive further changes in the field data sheet and then we have to take the data sheet out, again, to the Marinus. I'll go out and we look at it, and we hopefully come up with the same numbers. It is important that we have consistency. I should be able to go out, the students should be able to go out. After taking the training, going through this manual, we should come up with the same answer. If not, we have to go back to the drawing board because we cannot have that variation. It's got to be close. We need that accuracy. All right, and finally, well, not quite finally, implement training ready for personnel, check for consistency. Again, this is going to be a field protocol that people are going to have to go out and test it. And finally, work on adaption by the agencies of this system. Okay, so this is a, this is a long term process. We started it two years ago. We've made quite a bit of leeway. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be hopefully putting together the protocol manual within the next couple of weeks. With that, I am talked out. <laughs>